Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. We are going to get started in one minute. We're just going to allow everybody to come in through the waiting room, and then we'll go ahead and get started with the webinar. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jamie Strauss. I am the Chief Clinical Officer at Viz AI. Thank you so much for taking the time this evening to join us. We have an exciting webinar with two esteemed physicians on our panel to really talk about how AI is transforming the cardiology care paradigm in the real world. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Dr. Mittal to introduce himself and give an overview of his patient population and then to Dr. Jonathan Sue as well. Hi, Jamie. Thanks very much for having me. A pleasure to be here tonight. My name is Sunit Mittal. I'm Director of Electrophysiology and Medical Director of the Snyder Center for Comprehensive Atrial Fibrillation at the Valley Hospital in Ridgewood, New Jersey. Dr. Sue? Hi, Jamie. Uh, and hi, everyone. Hi, Sunit. Great to see everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Sue. I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist at University of California, San Diego. Uh, I'm an associate professor, clinical researcher, and a teacher. I'm an EP that specializes in all types of arrhythmias of the heart, particularly atrial fibrillation, uh, just like Dr. Mittal, and just have a really profound clinical research interest in atrial fibrillation, stroke, or oral anticoagulation, left atrial appendage occlusion, and all types of devices as well. So pleasure to be here, really looking forward to this. Thank you both for taking the time to join us this evening. Uh, for those of you in the audience, if you have questions as we go through the webinar, please enter them into the Q&A section. We'll take time at the end to address those. Um, before we kind of get into the panel discussion, I just want to give an overview of VizAI and who we are and, and what we do in the world of healthcare uh, ahead of the conversation and, and the great uh, discussions we're going to have with these two amazing physicians. So from a standpoint, and when we look at healthcare and we look at patient populations, we know that less than 20% of patients receive the right therapy in many diseases. And really at Viz, we are focused on these diseases that are often complex in care coordination, misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, and really require complex teams to coordinate care across multiple disciplines and oftentimes multiple institutions to care for these patients. When we talk about cardiovascular disease specifically, we know by 2035, we anticipate the cost to healthcare and the nation to be 1.1 trillion annually. And when you think of that, it's a pretty extensive amount of healthcare dollars going into cardiovascular disease. Um, and when we think about cardiovascular disease, you know, it's one of the, the most well-researched, well-domained disease state. However, it continues to be the number one killer and most expensive disease costing about $1 billion a day. And we haven't really seen much reduction in cardiovascular disease mortality, only at about less than 1% since 2011. And as the population continues to age and we continue to see people living longer, we continue to see increase in diagnoses in cardiovascular disease expected to increase 45% by 2035. And we know because of barriers to care within the community, needing um, pre-authorizations, there's often a long wait time for cardiologists to be able to see a patient um, due to some of the challenges within communities. And that's about 21 day average. So these are some of the foundational components that contribute to some of the challenges in caring for patients with cardiovascular disease, as well as you know, the healthcare dollars that get spent towards caring for these patients. So who is Viz? For those of you that don't know, we are adopted by 1300 hospitals and our mission is truly to increase access to life-saving treatments. 
And the way that that works is truly through AI powered care coordination. And uh, I was a Viz user before I joined Viz uh, in my organizations. And we see that, you know, the AI is really the trigger that helps enable care, but the care coordination that happens in the workflow is really where some of the magic happens. So when you think of, you know, your EHR such as Epic and Cerner, we think of that as the system of record. It's a repository for tons of healthcare data that's collated about a patient. However, it becomes challenging at times to really trigger action from that data. And that is what Viz is. Viz is that trigger of action. So what we do is we ingest all types of healthcare data uh, from imaging modalities, from CT, MR, uh, from ECGs, and from the EHR. And we take that information and we ingest it and we send it up to our cloud in real time and we run our algorithms um, and we do an AI analysis on those. And those algorithms can be done off of imaging, they can be done off of the ECG, they can be done off of NLP. And we then trigger that action. And when we say trigger action, it's really alerting and sending alerts and notifications to the appropriate care team members defined by an institution. Um, and that could be the specialist, it could be the ED providers, it can be critical care physicians, anybody that really needs to be alerted and notified of this finding of this patient to help them enable them to the best therapy. And when we do that, we're enabling therapy and triggering by triggering that action in that patient's what we call medical moment of truth, where they need to get to the right specialist at the right time for the right therapy. And when we talk about therapy, it can be very, they need to get to an emergent procedure like in stroke or PE, or they need to get to an appropriate drug therapy, or they are eligible for a clinical trial and making sure that they have the most appropriate access to the most appropriate care. Um, we really at Viz look to embed everything we do in clinical evidence and in, in the real world. And we have so many publications in real world evidence that we were actually awarded the first ever new technology add-on payment for an AI company. And that was grounded in the work that we did in Stroke, which was our first kind of beachhead of where we looked at the biggest impact that we could make for patients at that time. And what we saw through multiple studies was not only improvement in treatment time, so getting patients to the right provider in the right institution, we saw 87 minutes saved there, but we also saw improvement in patient outcomes. And when we looked at the stroke patient population where time is brain, we were able to have a 23% improvement where VIS was used in reduction of disability. The other key area that we put focus at looking at the impact was resource utilization, especially during COVID and now that it seems like we're almost out of COVID, but there continues to be resource constraints on the health systems, making sure you know care efficiency is critical for our, our, our clinicians and our providers, making sure that we are looking at what the impact is on the length of stay. So we saw the 3.5 day reduction in length of ICU stay because those patients were identified for treatment earlier and really were moved through the patient care continuum much quicker. And from a access to care standpoint, we saw 16% increase in patients treated for thrombectomy. Um, so when you look at stroke, you know, there isn't a true benchmark of how many patients should be eligible for mechanical thrombectomy. There's a lot of uh, suggestion in the literature that patients are often undertreated are ruled out for treatment. So really being able to go out into the community and screen patients that maybe would have not been connected to a specialist earlier led to that increase in access to care. So a natural extension for us from stroke and neurovascular was disease was cardiovascular as an adjacent um, you know, disease state for us. We know that most post-acute stroke patients require a cardiovascular workup, especially those in the cryptogenic stroke population, which we'll talk to Dr. Sue about and kind of his experience with that. But we knew that if we identified patients and we detected and diagnosed patients earlier and in real time, 
And we were able then to start streamlining them on that appropriate care pathway to get them to that plan of care prior to getting discharged. Um, we see great engagement across Viz uh, with our users really viewing alerts 90% of the time in less than five minutes. Uh, we also work very closely to ensure that those alerts are highly sensitive and specific so there isn't alert fatigue for our clinicians. And then we streamline and track the cardiac care pathways to move them through of why does this patient need to get to the cardiologist or the heart team? and ensuring that we're tracking where patients potentially could be falling off of that care pathway. So some of the challenges, and Dr. Sue will talk about this, you know, in post in cryptogenic stroke care pathway is a lot of patients aren't getting to the appropriate cardiac team for follow-up, whether that's inpatient or when they leave the hospital and they are scheduled for that outpatient, depending on patients access to care, it may be challenging for them to come back and get the appropriate follow-up care. We've also seen um, in a lot of care pathways, there's broken down communication between the neuro and cardiac teams. And how did we bridge that gap to ensuring everybody's talking about the patient in the right context, in the right way, in real time to ensure that they're getting the most appropriate post-acute stroke workup? And then we know that if patients leave without the appropriate intervention or monitoring that there is a suspected cardio um, source of stroke, that the reoccurrence of stroke is higher. They're, less, they're more likely to come back in with a readmission. And we know that those subsequent strokes often come with higher disability. So VizConnect was really built to bridge the gap between the stroke care team and the cardiac team. And we call it the heart team. And you'll, you'll hear a lot of times, and Dr. Sue can talk about, um, you know, the heart brain clinic and the heart brain team at UCSD. But really what happens is at the start of that acute stroke workup, the neuro team is involved triaging that patient. Do they need to go for a thrombectomy? Are they eligible for out of place? Is there anything we can do? And when that time ends in that acute moment, it's then immediately starting to think of what is the cause of the stroke? Do we know it? Do we not know it? If we don't know it, what is the appropriate workup that they need to get to the appropriate plan of care to prevent them from having reoccurring stroke? And this is done through truly just a, a button, we call it the easy button of connecting the stroke team to the heart team, and then being able to communicate, collaborate, and receive information as to why this patient's being referred for them to then make the most next best appropriate clinical decision for this patient. And we've seen great success with this. Uh, so we currently have piloted uh, Connect in 10 pilot sites, and we've seen a significant increase in the number of appropriate patient referrals to cardiology. So when we look back at retrospectively, these patients were, should have had a cardio referral and now we're making sure we're bridging the gap to get them to that cardiac referral. We've also seen significant decrease in time to referral. Um, for those of you that have been clinicians like myself, we know that we put in a referral, we wait until the next morning when they come in and pick up the patient list, and then they see the patient that they put in their orders for testing, and then work that patient up. And that can lead to that really long length of stay in those patients getting their stroke work up. Um, we've also seen significant um, increase in patients being seen prior to discharge, right? Reducing that risk of that patient going out into the community, going back home, not coming back in for their follow-up. And we've seen additional decrease in time for that, re that consult to happen. And we've seen a significant increase in patients, 2X, receiving the most appropriate monitoring. So whether that is uh, you know, uh, external monitor, a Holter monitor, a bio patch, uh, an implantable loop recorder, making sure those patients are leaving with the appropriate monitoring. So if there is underlying AFib occurring, we're able to capture that in other cardiac pathologies. So cryptogenic stroke was really our first kind of use case that we looked at in cardiovascular disease. And then we really um, became uh, intrigued with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the literature currently shows, has historically shown about one in 500 to one in 750 prevalence of HCM 
there's more recent literature that's come out that shows prevalence of about one in 200. But we know that these patients are, you know, pretty grossly underdiagnosed and misdiagnosed. And, and Dr. Mattel can talk significantly about the, his experience with this. But we know that these are younger patients. They typically don't have entry into the healthcare system because they're not sick. Even if they're getting screened from a sports medicine standpoint, oftentimes these patients aren't flagged as possibly having HCM. And we know that there's nonspecific symptoms. And if they don't get flagged and they don't get an echo for confirmatory diagnosis, we know that they are at risk for sudden cardiac death. So these are the athletes that you hear that sudden collapse on the field and often it's because of HCM. And it really is the leading cause of sudden cardiac death under the age of 35. So this is a very important population that we wanna capture and make sure they're getting to the right specialist for the appropriate follow-up. So we've launched a product called VizHCM for Research. So this is built on our platform and what we're able to do is receive AI findings off of an ECG that then note that this patient is likely to have suspect or has suspected HCM. You're able to, you know, trigger your notifications as you want to receive them. You can view the patients in the ECG viewer in real time with real measurements, and then you're able to coordinate the care with your research team or your clinical team to help capture that patient, make sure we're capturing them for the appropriate follow-up. So we um, have officially launched this in sites and we are really working on validating it and ensuring in the real world that it performs as it should. So we really went through a robust and rigorous AI development, um, really looked at 830,000 ECGs from 300,000 unique patients. And it covered not only obstructive HCM, but also non-obstructive HCM. And one thing to note that is always a topic of conversation in HEM is the demographics of the patients, right? Making sure we had a diverse population to train the model on to make sure that we included for racial and ethnic um, demographics, as well as from a global perspective and looked at it from outside of the US as well. And then we really validated it with the gold standard of echocardiogram and cardiac MRI. So current in our current sites and the way that we are uh, trending from a prevalence standpoint, we're looking at about one in 250 patients are flagged as a true HCM patient once they make it through their, uh, their workup. So that's an overview of VIZ. I'm really excited now to kind of have some in-depth discussion with our two physicians here. Um, I'm going to start with Dr. Sue first, and, and Dr. Mattel, you can answer as soon as he's complete, but Dr. Sue, from your perspective, when you think of the biggest challenges in clinical practice for cardiology, what are they today? Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Uh, well, to start with the challenges, right, we're going to start with uh, a little bit of a, a negative tone, but I, I'll try to make it not, uh, not so much as far as negative as far as challenges. I think we all have challenges and we want to improve on them. Uh, from my perspective, some of the largest challenges in cardiovascular cardiologists are are similar to what we're facing across the healthcare spectrum nowadays. Um, number one is just physician workload, burden, and admittedly, let's be honest, burnout, right? Uh, healthcare systems are, are stretched to the max, right? Um, so COVID-19, I think, took a lot out of everyone in healthcare across the spectrum, physicians, nurses, allied health, um, administrators. We, we're also busy, we have a lot less time uh, we have a lot less time to spend with our patients. We have a lot less time to spend with our families, and we have a lot less time to communicate with our fellow physicians. Uh, so I think that's one of the biggest concerns or uh, issues, challenges, is that is really all that stuff. Um, we need tools that make our lives easier uh, on the EMR side to communicate better with our referring physician. So number two would be um, other challenges that I think is detection. So early detection of disease processes. Uh, early detection tools. Again, we're all very busy. We could use another set of eyes, ears, mouths uh, to really communicate with each other. So if we, for example, take atrial fibrillation, um, you know, the most common cardiac arrhythmia in the United States and the world, we know it's under detected. We know it's under treated. 
if we just had tools to detect this atrial arrhythmia better, I think we'd all uh, appreciate that undetected stroke, undetected atrial fibrillation uh, would, would lead us to really treat our patients better, avoid stroke, avoid repeat strokes and uh, treat our patients with things like oral anticoagulation or left atrial appendage occlusion. I think tools like Viz AI, Viz Connect have allowed us to really leverage this opportunity for detection and use them in, in circumstances based on data and guidelines like Crystal AF and other guidelines that suggest implantable loop recorders for detection. So I think those are some of the, the things that are really challenging uh, cardiology nowadays. Yeah, Jamie, I want to add to Dr. Sue's comments in that this is an, obviously a very exciting time in uh, cardiology because there's a lot we can offer our patients. You know, you mentioned Viz AI uh, receiving breakthrough designation as an AI platform, but it's important to recognize that since this breakthrough pathway became available, there have been a number of approvals uh, in the cardiovascular space in general. Uh, and what that means is that there's a huge array of available choices and options that are available uh, to our patients. And one of the biggest challenges then is to find the patients uh, who can benefit from these therapies and get them to the right provider uh, at the right time. Uh, and as John mentioned, you know, uh, with the limited time that everyone has, uh, this can be difficult. Uh, so tools and techniques that can flag uh, patients who are at high risk for conditions or diseases would be an invaluable addition uh, to clinical practice. Thank you so much for those insights. Dr. Sue, you are one of our 10 pilot sites for VizConnect, and we've seen pretty great results coming out of UCSD. So I would love to talk to you a little bit about what are some of the biggest challenges you faced in the care of care pathway for cryptogenic stroke patients, you know, pre-Viz and before implementing it? Uh, great question, Jamie. Well, first of all, I'd like to take all the credit for that, but I can't. <laughs> because we do face challenges, right? Uh, from an EP perspective or cardiology perspective, let's just take our perspective or my perspective. Really the biggest challenge in the cryptogenic stroke pathway is really hearing about the patient to begin with, right? Uh, you know, a patient has a stroke, that's the outcome that there, therefore triggers in a clinician's mind, hey, perhaps this could be atrial fibrillation that is the etiology of this stroke. But uh, contrary to popular belief, I'm not, running up and down the neural stroke corridors and service, you know, looking for atrial fibrillation on every telemonitor. We rely on our colleagues to that with ultimate expertise, and they're wonderful to really identify these individuals, identify imaging or other uh, techniques that would make that patient a higher risk of stroke, and then getting that patient to uh, the proper therapy, getting the, a consult to a cardiologist or electrophysiologist in order to consider uh, other options. We know neurostroke uh, individuals are, are very busy uh, and they may not be able to let us know about someone that they suspect atrial fibrillation is. So tools that are able to have, you know, automated detection uh, that are able to prompt uh, neurostroke individuals or admittedly just able to help us communicate better, uh, I think have been invaluable. So really, I have to give all the credit to our stroke neurologist, but th those are the really the biggest challenges is really just even hearing about the patient and then subsequently being able to communicate in a, in a consultative manner. Uh, we've had experience with uh, tools such as Viz that have really helped with that and have gotten patients uh, specifically with atrial, uh, to look that are look that they're looking for atrial fibrillation to get either an external monitor or a plantable loop recorder. And uh, it's been very helpful. Thank you so much. I want to add uh, that, uh, you know, I think that there's a great opportunity for tools like Viz AI to kind of level the playing field. You I mean, you uh, having been in clinical medicine really outlined some of the challenges, which is that things get done tomorrow as opposed to being done today, right? So you call for the consult who sees the patient tomorrow. That consult may then decide on some imaging studies, which may or may not get done today, but may get done tomorrow. And then when you add it all up, you've lost a lot of time unnecessarily in the hospital. So to try to get this centralized in a more structured approach, 
really has not only the opportunity to be more resource uh, efficient, uh, but in the end, I suspect that patients will get better care because they will be treated in a more homogenous manner, uh, commensurate with uh, uh, clinical guidelines uh, and clinical pathways. So really applaud Viz AI for making that connection between neurology uh, and cardiology uh, and, and trying to streamline this patient for the uh, process, uh, streamline this process, you know, for the hundreds of patients who present with cryptogenic as well as ischemic stroke uh, to hospitals every year. Yeah, that's great, Dr. Mattel. I think also, so we talked a little bit about cryptogenic stroke. Can you talk about some of your current challenges in HCM patients and their pathway and how they get their care delivery? Yeah, so I think that um, uh, you in, uh, laid out the foundation, which is, you know, historically when I was in medical school, you know, I was told that one in 500 patients have HCM. You know, some of the more recent data by Dr. Barry Marin and others looking at worldwide estimates suggest that that number may be closer to one in 200. And I've heard others, you know, even raise the possibility uh, that it's more than that. Uh, and uh, the problem is that when we look at our EMR databases, uh, of both on the outpatient side as well as the inpatient side, we certainly don't see numbers anywhere close to that, neither one in 200 or one in 500, uh, and which really just speaks to the fact that likely many, many patients are being undiagnosed. Um, and uh, this uh, is a clinical pro problem. And as we go on, be happy to share with you, you know, some of the examples I've seen in clinical practice, you know, that speak uh, to the consequences of having undiagnosed HCM. Yeah, I think that would be great. I'd love to have that conversation as we get a little bit further down. Uh, the question for both of you, really, can you talk a little bit about, like, there's a lot of excitement around artificial intelligence in the healthcare space, right? Like, it, for those of you that go to conferences and go to RSNA, like, there's, like, I don't know, probably 300, 500 AI companies on the floor there. But how do you really see AI impacting healthcare delivery in general in your practices? Yeah, I'll start with this one, uh, Jamie. <laughs> but, and by no means am I claiming that I'm an AI expert. Uh, <laughs> what I am an expert is, is taking care of patients. But uh, in regards to AI and what I know about it, I just think about, you know, what am I hearing about? How do I understand th this technology? And what do I need help with, right, as a, as a busy clinician? I think uh, not, not being able to synthesize perhaps data uh, in large quantities as uh, an algorithm or a computer would be able to is really help with detection and therefore early detection of a disease process with screening imaging, ECGs, things like that, that, you know, I can't run through a thousand EKGs in, in a few minutes and, and, and validate it and then test it in another cohort, right? So it's really that type of uh, validated and tested uh, AI algorithm that, that will really, I think, help clinicians. So that's how I understand in the healthcare aspect, but also in regards to anything that would help with better care coordination across teams and mainly communication. So those are the two areas that I think uh, AI could help in, 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 a, in a busy, you know, general healthcare practice type of scenario. And Jamie, you know, I would say that, you know, on the one hand, although it sounds like, you know, a buzzword that's, you know, thrown up uh, repeatedly now, it's hard to argue that AI is going to be transformative in the way we do things. Obviously, anyone who's played with ChatGPT can speak to, you know, just the power of this uh, type of uh, technology. You know, in clinical practice, we've been very interested in this. John mentioned earlier that as electrophysiologists, you know, we follow a lot of patients with implantable loop recorders, you know, whether they're placed for known AF or suspected AF as in patients with cryptogenic stroke. And we know that that creates a lot of work on, uh, for providers to, uh, you know, adjudicate the data. Uh, uh, and often much of the data is false positive. So, you know, we've had a strong interest in this area uh, in looking at the role of AI in whittling away some of the work that's entailed in, you know, adjudicating false positive episodes. And, you know, we now have commercially available technology to do this. And it shows that there's a 70% reduction in the likelihood that you're going to have to adjudicate, you know, an episode that's really garbage and not reflective of atrial fibrillation. So that's very important. Uh, it's very important from a clinical trial standpoint, you know, having systems that can use AI uh, to identify patients within your databases of EMR, 
you know, who could be uh, benefit from an ongoing clinical trial or a procedure uh, that your center is offering, I think will also be very helpful. And then you spoke to something earlier, which is, you know, trying to find other diseases uh, that are hard to diagnose, uh, uh, diagnosed late, where early diagnosis can have an impact for patients. I can think of two right off the bat, you know, something like cardiac amyloid and cardiac sarcoidosis. Uh, and so the application of AI, you know, beyond HCM into these disease processes will likely be transformative as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that rare disease is like a huge opportunity and where those patients are really just misdiagnosed or too late diagnosed and they can't get the treatment that they need. Dr. Sue, you have been using BizConnect and we highlighted that a little bit. Would love to hear a little bit about your experience and the impact that you've seen on the cryptogenic stroke uh, patient population with the use of BizConnect. Sure, I'd uh, be happy to share. Uh, again, would love to take all the credit in, in that regard, but uh, we do have to give credit to our neurostroke colleagues. Really, they've been using uh, pretty much all aspects of Viz AI, as I understand it, in the neural platform and then uh, felt that it would be useful, given their success in, in that arena, to really expand it into, into cardiac. And in VizConnect specifically, what they were looking for is a really a way to interface easily, uh, quickly, uh, and effectively with, with our team, really, the cardiologists or electrophysiologists, mainly for an efficient communications uh, piece and, and cons consultative piece. So, how we use Viz Connect specifically in our institution is that our neurostroke colleagues who are using this easy to use application anyways for a lot of their clinical neural workflow uh, then use the same app to really call in a consultation for us in a patient that they suspect atrial fibrillation in. And that consult uh, comes to us very quickly. We respond quickly uh, and are able to understand the consultative question, what they're looking for, uh, can communicate specifically if if they're asking for a external monitor, an implantable loop recorder for atrial fibrillation, uh, that we can then uh, quickly and easily get uh, that done for them. And really, it's been uh, pretty wildly successful at our institution, really as a communicating communication piece, uh, and has really brought the neuro stroke team and our cardiology. Team team really closely and made their overall, I would say, happiness uh, and ease of communication much easier, specifically with our team. You know, we're a very um, referral-based specialty, obviously, in electrophysiology. We want to help out. We want to help these patients. And by having this really, really easy-to-use app, uh, you know, if we're scrubbed in a procedure, somebody else can uh, respond. And uh, our, our consultative uh, service, I think, has has really been tremendously aided by this, and, and the, our neurostroke individuals have been quite happy. Can you talk a little bit about, like, I know there's, I think you guys are working on some publications, so I don't want you to give away too much data, but can you talk a little bit about, like, pre -vis and post -vis, like, what the actual impact on the workflow has been, like, for those patients getting to the actual intervention that they need or the therapy that they need? Yeah, let's just take um, the impact that Viz Connect has had at our institution, kind of pre and post this this application, uh, and specifically for what we do as electrophysiologists, implantable loop recorders for cryptogenic stroke uh, and AF detection. Before Viz was implemented, we'd probably get consultations for this specific question about zero to one time per month. And just last month, you know, we were up to anywhere about 10 to 12 uh, specific uh, consults for this question. And my understanding from the neural stroke perspective is it's not just, um, you know, we're not just playing a numbers game here. This is something where they just feel like uh, probably that this was always uh, something that they, they wanted. They just found that the ease of communication, the ease of getting what they needed especially in an inpatient type environment when one captures somebody in, at the at the at the time of their stroke has been instrumental in treating these patients in the outpatient setting as well um, we all know in the outpatient setting that these individuals have a lot of different tests to run brain scans to uh, obtain and seeing a cardiologist or electrophysiologist on their list of many consultations 
may not be as beneficial as in the inpatient setting. So that's just an example in regards to numbers. Dr. Mattel, can you, hearing Dr. Sue talk about a little bit about his experience, how do you think that would translate over into your practice arena, Valley? I think that uh, the biggest issue has to just do with standardization of the process today. When a post-stroke patient is referred to a cardiologist, maybe that cardiologist has expertise in TE imaging, and maybe they don't. And that's going to dictate a lot whether the patient undergoes a transesophageal echo. Maybe that cardiologist has expertise in extended Holter monitoring or mobile telemetry monitoring or implantable loop recorders, and maybe they don't. And that's going to then dictate a little bit about what kind of monitoring strategy they have. That stands in contrast to the ideal system uh, where patients would all have an echo, would all have transesophageal echocardiography, and potentially all be implanted with a cardiac monitor prior to hospital discharge. And that level of standardization, I think, is only possible when you're using platforms like VizAI, AI, uh, which are kind of, uh, you know, homogenizing the process uh, and tailoring evaluation and management according to evidence-based uh, data that's available. That's great. Thank you both so much. Uh, Sunita, I'm going to kick it back to you. Uh, what challenges in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy could AI address? And I think this would be a great opportunity for you to kind of like weigh in on some of the cases that you've seen. Yeah. So, you know, HCM is a great uh, disease entity because, uh, you know, I can always think in clinical practice of some of the areas where, you know, it really would have made a big difference. And I think it's important to recognize that because uh, John and I, you know, are electrophysiologists, we typically encounter HCM patients one of two ways, you know, tangentially because they've developed atrial fibrillation or because the diagnosis has already been made and we're being asked to weigh in on whether uh, the patient is at high risk of sudden cardiac death uh, and would benefit from a therapy such as a defibrillator. But it's interestingly, somehow patients come uh, through the channels for totally unrelated reasons. And I'll share two clinical examples with you that have always left an indel indelible you know, mark for me. So the first was a patient I saw about a decade ago, a man in his early 60s, very healthy, no family history of anything significant, who was really referred to me because he had paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Uh, and the question that his cardiologist posed for me uh, was that whether we should do anything about the atrial fibrillation. Now, the patient was entirely asymptomatic with respect to AFib, but what struck me was that although the patient had a normal echocardiogram, and a normal exercise stress test with nuclear perfusion imaging, his ECG was very abnormal. Uh, and in fact, it had ECG changes that were highly suggestive of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And when I reviewed ECGs taken for years in the past of this patient, sure enough, uh, the, all the ECGs looked exactly the same. Now, despite the fact that this patient was cared by a very experienced internist and cardiologist, none of them were struck by the fact that there could be a relationship between this ECG and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We went on to pursue a cardiac MRI, which in this case confirmed that the patient indeed suffered from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, it's important to make that diagnosis, not just because it's always important to make the right diagnosis, but it turns out that most cardiologists use an acronym called the chads VAS score to determine whether a patient is or is not at high risk of stroke and whether they do or do not need oral anticoagulation. And by that metric, this patient was low risk, uh, except for the fact that this metric doesn't apply to patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, right? And so having something like Viz AI that could basically screen these ECGs and alert a provider that the patient may have HCM, you know, could be very valuable. Now that's Good. That's a good example. Uh, but in this case, the ECG was abnormal. And maybe you could argue that a more experienced clinician would have picked that up earlier. So let me share with you even a more provocative example uh, 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 of another patient. So a man was referred to me in his uh, 50s with, again, no cardiovascular risk factors with this time persistent atrial fibrillation. In this case, his CHADS VAS score 
was zero, maybe one in that he had borderline readings. And the U.S. guidelines state that in a patient like this, oral anticoagulation is optional, and this patient chose to treat themselves with aspirin. In this case, the ECG was relatively unremarkable to my eye, you know, other than the AFib, and echo just showed concentric LVH, and again, a nuclear stress test was unremarkable. Now, the patient several months later actually presented with a large stroke. Fortunately, there was no deficit, and now that the patient had a stroke, the patient was started on oral anticoagulation. Again, the basic imaging studies failed to diagnose any major abnormalities. Now, fast forward two years, the patient is out of hospital and the patient suffers an out of hospital cardiac arrest. Uh, the patient is resuscitated using an AED. The ventricular fibrillation is documented. Thankfully, the patient survives. Once again, an echocardiogram just shows concentric LVH Cardiac catheterization shows normal ventricular function and no coronary disease. Well, in this case, you know, we decided to pursue a cardiac MRI, and lo and behold, the patient had HCM. You know, there was a 1.7 centimeter septal thickness, and although the echoes had been read as concentric LVH, this patient indeed had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, in this case, the patient suffered two consequences. One was the stroke. Uh, again, uh, the CHADS VAS score here was not predictive of anything. And secondly, uh, was a uh, cardiac arrest. Now, I think to myself, could AI have detected this patient to be a high-risk HCM patient? This patient did not have any ECG abnormalities that, to my eye, suggested any abnormalities. And if it could, this would be a game changer, right? Because now you could identify diseases early and potentially save this kind of patient from the first event, which was a stroke, and then the second event, which was even more devastating, which was the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And I suspect most providers you know, in practice can identify similar types of patients and hence the real need for early identification of these rare type diseases. Yeah, those are pretty compelling stories there. And I think probably AI could have played a role in both of them. Dr. Sue, any thought or any patient experiences you've had uh, for HCM that you think AI really could have made an impact in? Yeah, no, I think uh, I'll provide some thoughts to Dr. Mittal's uh, cases. Uh, Duneet, those are really, really interesting cases and clinical conundrums that we really uh, uh, struggle with, I think. Dr. Mittal brings up a really uh, very important point about the chads vas score really being applicable uh, in most populations, but not in the populations such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, amyloidosis, and hyperthyroidism. So just even some kind of tool that can identify these individuals that are lie outside our standard clinical care, care metrics with AFib or identify patients with HCM can be, can be very helpful from a clinical management perspective. And then number two, I would say specific to HCM, would be just this this song and dance that sometimes happens around HCM and its risk for sudden cardiac death. Um, it's an unfortunate and major issue with HCM. Uh, oftentimes, electrophysiologists are the ones that really get to the um, crux of the issue of why this is important, not that it's just a muscle disease of the heart. And, and really, really detecting these individuals earlier so that they see or have a pathway to see an electrophysiologist could be very helpful and getting them to the right person to have these even maybe challenging discussions uh, to, to think about this aspect before uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest or cardiac arrest may happen. Yeah, it's really, really impactful. Thank you. Um, I know we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but I want to dive in a little bit deeper with both of you, but starting with you, Dr. Sue. So what are some of the applications for A that you see becoming more commonly used in cardiology? We're ahead of ACC, right? We're rolling into ACC in a couple weeks. What do you anticipate the future of AI in cardio spaces? Uh, great question. Uh, I definitely think screening could be a an, uh, an big application for for AI. Uh, listen, I'm no no, no AI expert, so uh, I know enough about the concept and understand when you know there's a, way too much information in front of me uh, that perhaps I can't 
validate, train myself in, in that manner and do it as quickly as uh, maybe chat GPT or AI can. Uh, so, you know, in a cogent, non-biased manner, I think uh, AI could perhaps do that, especially in a well-trained and well-validated cohort as has been done in some of these things. So number one, screening. So as long as AI has had a chance to be validated, we could look, uh, AI could look at things such as disease states as atrial fibrillation, um, mild hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, maybe echo-based diagnosis, CT MRI-based diagnosis, and heart conditions. Those are the those are the forays I feel like AI could make in cardiac care and cardiac arrhythmia. And then number two would be personalized treatment therapy for specific patients. If a if a disease is suspected and even confirmed, perhaps an AI algorithm could help in in several ways. Right? Maybe one an automatic referral to the specialist of choice uh, with, an, uh, with, with that type of care flow or care pathway already maintained. Number two, communication between a generalist and a specialist that is already built in or, or baked into the system. And, and then number three, as we've seen with other AI uh, uh, spectrum, uh, things across the spectrum, maybe uh, even as far as education or, or a stab at po possible therapies for a specific condition or perhaps even a list of, of things to think about, not necessarily do, but think about in, in or other tests are up. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Dr. Mattel, anything additional to add? Listen, if we want to be really provocative to build on what John just said, I think it's really the minority report of, uh, uh, type of scenario of the future, right? Predicting things before they'll occur you know, the group at Mayo has done a wonderful job, you know, looking at ECGs to, you know, predict who will develop atrial fibrillation, predict who will have left ventricular dysfunction. You know, one day maybe we can predict who's going to do well, you know, after catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation and, and many such scenarios, uh, thus, you know, uh, ushering in an era of more personalized, uh, you know, medicine, you know, where we're risk stratifying patients a little bit better than we're able to do today. I think that, you know, that's something uh, that I expect a lot of work to go into over the last, de over the next decade. Great. And I think, you know, we've talked about a little bit, and I'm going to stay with you, Dr. Mattel, but we've talked about amyloidosis and other things, but where are the other areas that really you see the future beyond kind of HCM, cryptogenic stroke, the other cardiovascular disease states where the need for faster time to detection or better workflow is really needed in this patient, these patient populations. Yeah, Jamie, so I look at it as two ends of the spectrum. So we focused a little bit earlier on those rare diseases, you know, where, where we talked about amyloid or sarcoid or HCM. But then I believe there's also a role on the other end of the spectrum by things that are seen so commonly and yet still continue to have a big conundrum with uh, respect to diagnostic workup and risk stratification. And a classic example of that is syncope. Uh, so syncope, you know, occupies bed after bed in the hospital, you know, is associated with probably one in 20 hospital admissions, uh, is traditionally associated with a wide and varied workup in the hospital, tends to be cost ineffective, a resource inefficient, uh, and so AI, I think, has a strong role in patients like that, you know, for early risk stratification, identifying patients who need continued inpatient uh, observation slash workup versus those who really appear to be at very low risk and can be, you know, managed in, you know, less resource intensive conditions. So I think on both ends of the spectrum, uh, there's great opportunities. Yeah, at Syncopes, I remember working on patient improvement projects, as we called them in my previous life. Syncope, the observation beds were like greater than 50% were usually syncope, syncope patients and trying to work them up appropriately. Dr. Sue, any additional thoughts you have? On yeah, where... I mean, while we're, while we're in our uh, wish list of things that AI could do for us to make our job easier and in cardiovascular care, we might as well talk about other disease states. You know, detection of myocardial infarction, ST segment deviation, time is myocardium, getting to the cath lab. One could see how when you say, say specific time and, and having, you know, some kind of algorithm to, uh, through an EKG move quickly and try to be predictive, you could see how that could be helpful. Uh, you know, if, if this type of technology can be applied to other imaging modalities, such as echocardiography, detection of heart failure or risk of, of, of sudden cardiac death, 
uh, outside of just the ejection fraction could be some uh, a way that this could be used. And then back to the EKG, you know, help in differentiating ventricular tachycardia from other types of Y-complex tachycardias or other types of heart block, uh, you know, certainly could be helpful uh, in, in regards to AI and the ECG. Yeah, I think they're all great areas to consider. I'm going to open it up to the Q&A before I kind of open it up. Do any of you have any additional thoughts or anything we didn't hit on that you think uh, we missed or should highlight ahead of Q&A? No? No. Okay. All right. So for those of you in the audience, we have had a couple questions come in. If you have any additional questions, please add them in. Uh, one question came in, uh, with AI being used more frequently in clinical practice, um, how should life science companies think about leveraging AI in developing and evaluating treatments? Do either of you want to take that? I'll open it up to both of you. Well, I think that uh, uh, you certainly have an opportunity to understand, you know, what kind of populations you may be treating uh, at your center locally. We've started to use uh, AI, you know, before embarking on clinical trials. You know, that process is time consuming and expensive. And we, we want to be sure that there is a, a adequate return on our investment and there are patients in our uh, uh, cohort that we follow who could benefit from these trials. So one way that we're using it increasingly is to make sure uh, that we are bringing those trials that are most relevant uh, to our local community. Uh, and I suspect uh, uh, that's one way. Another area is trying to uh, find patients who are in the system who are under referred uh, for evidence based therapies. You know, two that come to mind are, uh, or, 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 or three that come to mind are, uh, are, are um, left atrial appendage closure in the right patient, you know, mitral uh, clipping for mitral regurgitation, and ICD implantation for primary prevention of sudden death in patients with low ejection fraction. Uh, and the AI, again, by identifying these patients and alerting providers uh, may be able uh, uh, to, to make it easier uh, to identify patients who are not receiving all evidence-based therapies that are currently available. Yeah, Dr. Sue, any thoughts? I wanna come back and touch on the clinical trial stuff, but Dr. Sue, wanna flip it over to you? Yeah, Dr. Mattel brings up great, great uh, topics. Well, again, we're on our uh, grab bag uh, aspect of uh, what we wish AI could do and how companies can leverage this type of technology. Other disease state or treatment states would be uh, evaluating patients uh, that could be at risk for falls or bleeds you know, with oral anticoagulation uh, in the decision to start that medication for pharmaceutical companies or not. Um, and uh, and if not, then as Dr. Mittal talked about, left atrial appendage occlusion uh, could be could be uh, an option, and then determining say who uh, who is at risk for adverse events from one of these uh, procedures. So looking at risk of adverse events, I think from a procedural perspective, could also uh, uh, companies could also utilize this this type of technology. Yeah, that's great. I am I'm actually currently at a clinical trial summit and you know we work really closely on a number of clinical trials on our Viz recruit side but would love to hear from your perspective. I know you both are involved in a number of trials. What are some of the biggest challenges in like screening patients into clinical trials? And with the FDA recently coming out with a recommendation of diversity in patient populations, how do you really like look at where AI plays a role in that um, for you all? So I think the second point is so vitally important. Uh, you know, obviously you are somewhat uh, at the mercy of the patient population that you serve locally, but within that population, I think the data are overwhelming that you know there, uh, you know, unconscious bias uh, will uh, uh, can you know impact whether a provider is going to offer a clinical trial uh, to a patient or not. So having something like AI, which uh, democratizes the process and alerts providers. You know, just simply based on eligibility, uh, uh, it, it makes it uh, a little bit nicer, I think, in, in being able to identify patients and then hopefully moving them forward to the, uh, uh, to the evaluation process. Uh, Jamie, I think the biggest challenge is, is that, you know, trials are based on 
eligibility and uh, you know exclusion criteria and sometimes there may be challenges using your EMR you know to identify you know that kind of uh, patient I'll give you two examples that we struggle with in e in our EMR to identify patients who are appropriate candidates for heart failure therapies for example one is many of the trials require some uh, assessment of New York Heart Association class heart failure, you know, and it has to be, let's say, for example, class three or greater. Well, what we find in our database is that we're really good about capturing heart failure. We're very good about capturing that it's systolic heart failure. We're not always so great uh, at, at capturing whether it's New York Heart Association two, three, or four heart failure in a way that's objectively defined uh, and can be reproducibly used. Another example I'll give you is BNP. So many heart failure studies have a biomarker requirements. And uh, at our institution, for example, we measure BNP and many heart failure studies now use NT-PRO BNP. So you're gonna have a real challenge then identifying patients who meet all eligibility and ineligibility criteria because you happen to be using a different tool at your institution for routine clinical work. And I'm sure I can come up with other examples, but this is what makes it hard to rely exclusively on AI. Yeah, I think that's great. We've actually in this discussion here just had a couple great questions coming in. So one, I wanna to flip to you, Sunit, because this was uh, something you brought up. You mentioned AI and cardiac uh, sarcoidosis. To what extent, at what point would you recommend AI workup for the patients that are suspected? Yeah, so I think that's a terrific question. And, you know, I think that one of the beauties of um, uh, that, what you showed Jamie earlier is that really you wouldn't expect much of anything once these systems are refined, when the patient had their ECG, and let's just use ECG as a as the starting point because, you know, it's ubiquitous, it's uh, done routinely, both in primary care offices and cardiology. The hope would be when that uh, uh, ECG is run, just like you showed with HCM uh, being flagged, that once it's been trained and validated for additional rare states, that ECG uh, would be run on all of these algorithms and a provider would get an alert notification as to which disease state uh, is most at risk for that given patient. So you wouldn't even be actively running anything as opposed to the ECG would automatically be run and you would be, uh, and, and a flag would appear, um, uh, you know, for the relevant disease process. Yeah, I think that's great. There's another question that came in around clinical trial. I'll read the question and then I'll give kind of what Viz is doing and then you both can weigh in on any additional thoughts that you have. So how will AI help in clinical trial recruitment and identifying patients? This will be from the EHR. What is the next expected step for AI for making recruitment more streamlined and effective? And how will we ensure diversity in the trials for better analysis and results? So I can talk on my end of what we're doing at Viz. So really on our Viz Recruit platform, we take our algorithms and we augment them to meet the needs of the inclusion exclusion criteria of the patient. So sometimes that is pulling in from the EHR specific data points, but it's really building the tool and the algorithm around flagging these patients that are most appropriate. And when we think about diversity in clinical trials, the PIs are often at these quaternary high academic research centers, right? Where you may not have visibility out into your community hospitals or spokes for patients that would be eligible for clinical trials. So from the Viz perspective, not only do we augment the algorithm to meet the inclusion exclusion criteria, we then turn it on out into the outlying community centers where the PI has really a tool 24 seven screening patients and flagging these patients that are eligible for enrollment which really when you get out into the community that's where your diversity is right in your demographics and your populations and you're also mitigating bias to sunit's point because you're not seeing age race sex i mean we see age come in but age race sex any variable demographics you're looking just at the clinical evidence of the patient in that moment and saying like hey this is a good patient uh that meets eligibility for this trial sunit jonathan i'll, I'll just turn it over to you you guys have yeah, someone, uh, Jamie, as someone who uh, practices at one of these, uh, you know, community hospitals, you know, that has 
you know, the full spectrum of patients from initial diagnosis to more detailed things, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think the next, uh, or, you know, aspect of it is today I've laid out a scenario where, you know, you'd be alerted or I'd be alerted, uh, uh, you know, for trials that we're conducting at our institution, but ultimately we all are committed to doing the right thing uh, for our patients. And, you know, the ideal system would also alert us to patients who are eligible for trials that are being done elsewhere. Uh, and if the clinical condition warrants, we would then be able to direct them, you know, to providers uh, at outside institutions if necessary, if that meant that they would be enrolled uh, in a trial of high scientific merit. Yeah, I, mean, that's great. yeah I can comment real quick too. You know, even at an academic institution, you know, we're so busy clinically that it's really difficult for us to even oftentimes think about all the clinical research projects that we have. So any type of tool that makes it quickly, easily uh, uh, can screen a patient chart through their patient data faster and more efficiently than a human being could or one of our research assistants or even ourselves could. And just any kind of things that can interface with a reminder tool could be really beneficial. Uh, Cause as we know, uh, a lot of uh, IRB type uh, situations require some kind of introduction or, or uh, clinician uh, interaction rather than a cold call from an individual. So, so these can be really important in clinical care of these patients at, at the bedside. Jamie, did we lose you? I think we may have. You there, Dr. Sue? Ah, there you are. We lost yep. you for a second, Jamie. I don't know what happened. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> Uh, hotel Wi-Fi, I apologize. Um, I know we're at time, so I, I want to thank everybody really for joining us. And there was a couple questions that came in that we haven't been able to get to, so we can work on answering them offline. But I want to thank both of you so much for your time today and really your valuable insights. And for those of you in the audience, if you have more questions, you can reach out to us and learn more about our solution at viz.ai. So thank you all so much for joining us and have a great evening. Thank you both. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.